Thank you, Justin. Good morning, honoured guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Can I start by acknowledging the Gadigal people and the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of this land and this wonderful harbour that has been such a magnificent amphitheatre for the celebrations over the last few days and uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'm pleased that for the third time in a row at the Sea Power Conference that we're able to kick off the conference uh, with what is fast becoming the traditional service chief's session. And I welcome my friend and colleague, Lieutenant General David Morrison, the Chief of Army, and Air Vice Marshal Mel Hupfeld, the Air Commander, who is representing the Chief of Air Force, and Marshal Jeff Round, who is uh, unavoidably um, detained on other duties today. Now, this session is important from the Australian perspective because it reinforces the fundamentally joint approach that we take to the profession of arms. Now, last year, we had a similar session at the Chief of Armies Conference down in Melbourne, which further underscored this joint approach. To me, one of the most important things about this session is it gives us the ability to talk directly to a number of our own serving members, particularly our younger members who attend these conferences, and for them to hear straight from the three chiefs um, the same basic message. And I think that is a very powerful message that underscores that joint approach that we are taking. It underscores how serious the CDF is and in fact the whole senior leadership of the ADF is about the joint endeavour that we're embarked on. For our many international visitors, I thank you for visiting Australia, for visiting Sydney and for attending the Sea Power Conference this year. To my counterparts and their personal representatives, I thank you for making the journey. I know it's a long way because I make the journey quite a bit the other way. Um, I really appreciate the time that you've been able to devote to not only the conference but to the uh, International Fleet Review. I know it's also a difficult month this month with the International Sea Power Symposium at Rhode Island, so the fact that so many of you have attended and will probably have to make that journey as well is, is greatly appreciated. Uh, due, to, due to the continuing International Fleet Review commitments, and it's important to note that that has not finished yet, um, the time that I would normally have to engage one-on-one -on -one is considerably reduced from a normal sea power conference and uh, I appreciate your understanding uh, in that. The theme of the conference this year is Naval Diplomacy and Maritime Power Projection, the Utility of Navies in the Maritime Century. The opportunity to bring forward this conference to coincide with the International Fleet Review was one that we simply could not pass up. And I'm particularly pleased that we have made that decision. Because in so many ways, the strength of the international presence here is the best tangible demonstration of this conference's theme. Whether a nation has sent a ship, an aircraft, or a delegation, our activities over the last few weeks, and it is weeks, are a practical demonstration of naval diplomacy. Some of the value is evident to all, like the exercises which have gone before and which will follow the International Fleet Review activities. These exercises further our ability to cooperate in the pursuit of good order at sea. I would particularly like to acknowledge the success of the first ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus Expert Working Group for Maritime Security Field Training Exercise. We really have to come up with a better name, Tansri, than that. Um, which took place in the waters and off the coast of Jarvis Bay uh, about this time last week. 11 ships and 13 countries participated in this activity. The Maritime Security Expert Working Group has been co-hosted by Malaysia and Australia uh, for the last couple of years. And I thank my Malaysian counterpart, Admiral Aziz Tansri. Um, it has been a pleasure to work so closely with Madame Suriani and her team as we have taken um, this whole concept from inception to a major field training exercise in very short order. 
and it has been that the leadership shown by your team and the, the enthusiastic participation of the other nations involved that have allowed us to uh, generate this activity so quickly. And while events such as the fleet review enable diplomacy writ large, with fair dollops of pomp, pageantry and ceremony, they serve much more than a historical or commemorative purpose. Just as there were specific messaging in reviews of centuries gone by, not all of them friendly messaging, I think the international nature of this review reinforces one of our most fundamental maritime security messages that we all share. And that is that maritime security is an inherently cooperative and collaborative venture. We cannot protect our ability to trade on our own. It is a genuine team effort. Of course, you don't need a fleet review to achieve this. We can see the same elements at work when a patrol boat visits a minor port or two ships conduct a simple passage exercise. The aggregate effect of such activities goes towards building habits of cooperation which we can apply for mutual national benefit. So thank you all for attending because our practical demonstration of naval diplomacy on a grand scale is made up of the effort of each and every nation and navy which is represented and each and every interaction and activity that we undertake. I think it's worthwhile setting out what naval diplomacy is, to ask what distinguishes it from other forms of diplomacy and to examine how then it fits with and supports a nation's overall diplomatic effort. For me, at its most fundamental, naval diplomacy springs from the common bond amongst mariners. These common bonds do not replace or overtake national allegiance, of course, but a shared understanding of the marine environment offers different ways of engaging and different ways of viewing the subject. Through this, we can offer alternative paths to understanding and cooperation. Of course, communication in and of itself is not the answer to all our difficulties, but it is most certainly an essential requirement to resolving problems. Many of the customs, understandings and freedoms on which we depend for the exercise of naval diplomacy date from the age of sail, when the commanding officer of a ship was in many ways left to fend for himself while conducting a mission. Communications were slow and the ship's captain may not have known that conflict between two countries had either concluded or broken out and this at times had some undesirable, unforeseen consequences. The modern incarnation is much more complex. The ubiquity of modern communications enable innumerable relationships and channels of communication around the world, not least through a professional diplomatic corps. As a result, successful modern naval diplomacy is a tool in the broader conduct of the nation's diplomatic mission. Maritime forces remain a very practical expression of a nation's willingness and ability to be involved in a region. This idea of giving practical expression to a nation's policy direction is important. It distinguishes good intentions and substantive action. This enables maritime forces to be one of the primary tools that nations employ in difficult circumstances. Whether that be humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, surveillance and enforcement, or the threat or ultimate projection and use of maritime power. By virtue of their routine deployments, navies can help form habits of cooperation and understanding with neighbours, partners and allies. They are directly and immediately responsive to the direction of government through ministers. And I will think I think it will be very interesting to hear from two former Australian Defence Ministers on their employment of the Navy as a diplomatic tool later in the conference. While naval diplomacy has a great history, I do not think we can afford to simply assume it will continue on indefinitely in its current format. The way humanity uses the marine environment is changing and national desire for maritime trade and resources is expanding. 
Now, this slide is um, an unashamedly Australian-centric perspective of the Indo-Pacific. It shows the key arteries of the ma maritime global trading system in our region. And I think it has helped focus Australian strategic thought develop on the importance of this broader region and its relationship to Australia's security and prosperity. So what are the changes? Nations are increasingly looking to the sea for additional food and energy resources. According to the United Nations Food and Agric Agricultural Organisation, the worldwide production of farmed fish has recently overtaken that of beef. Fish farming, offshore oil and gas, and more recently, alternative en energy production such as wind and wave energy, has led to an extension of permanent human infrastructure into the maritime environment. The wind farm arrays in the North Sea are a prominent example. The floating offshore production and storage concept is being taken to a new level with floating LNG plants. There is one under construction at present, likely to be the first one in the world to enter service when it's deployed off the northwest coast of Australia in 2017. It will be 488 metres long and displace nearly 600,000 tonnes. If it is not a resource a nation can produce or extract for itself, then it is to the sea and to the global maritime trading system that nations will look. The cost of transporting a shirt from its place of manufacture to its place of sale, just about regardless of where those two points are, is about one cent. Effectively, the location of where something is produced, be it the finished product or a component, is increasingly less important because the cost of transporting it where it needs to go is almost trivial. Even if this cost estimate is out by um, one or two orders of magnitude, the point remains. As a result, our economies are as intimately linked as they ever have been. The influence of the global maritime trading system is all pervasive. The reliability of the system means that companies clearly carry less and less inventory. So interruptions to their global, just-in-time supply chains have an enormous impact. And those interruptions can occur almost anywhere around the world. These are global trends, with many aspects of them expressed forcefully in the Indo-Pacific. The shift of strategic interest and weight to this region, this inherently maritime region, will only reinforce those trends. For me, the huge increase in humanity's maritime interests and footprint leads to three immediate conclusions. First, I think we need to re-examine the basis of our strategic thinking. While the likes of Mahan, Corbett, Richmond, Cable, Booth, we can add Till and Booth, oh, Till and Grove, just to make a couple of the members of the audience happy, provide a good basis. But I do not think they offer a complete understanding of the challenges that we face into the future, nor do I think it is reasonable to expect that they should. In the Australian context, this re-examination is centred around the emerging notion of a maritime school of strategic thought. To counter the continentalist and expeditionary schools of thought that have dominated Australian strategic thought for some time. Now, shifting our basic strategic cultural predisposition in Australia is not a simple task. And it is something I know that the Chief of Army will focus on in his talk shortly, so I will not steal his thunder. Second, as we have all recognised for many years, and as I have touched on already, it is beyond the capacity of any nation to unilaterally protect its maritime interests because of the nature of the maritime global trading system. Certainly, it can be done some of the time and in some specific locations, but just as certainly, not everywhere and not all the time. Maintaining good order at sea is fundamentally a collective and cooperative activity. That means we have to work together, which to me is the basis for naval diplomacy. Third, as nations seek to make more intensive use of marine resources, maritime forces are likely to be at the forefront of regulating 
that use. Good order at sea may well require a larger and more specific body of knowledge, a rules-based order which enables all nations to benefit. We'll inevitably need maritime forces which can observe and ex enforce this order. This will involve the effective conduct of a mix of constabulary, war fighting and diplomatic tasks. I think the idea of modern naval diplomacy being a far more integrated activity is something we should pursue in greater detail. Australia, like many nations, has been on a journey to build joint forces. In an operational war fighting sense, I think we have achieved great success. Indeed, the whole is so evidently greater than the sum of the parts. I think we must ask the question, how do we build on this concept in the constabulary and the diplomatic arenas? We need to look at ways in which we can achieve joint military diplomatic efforts. And certainly for Australia, as we contemplate the imminent arrival of the Canberra class amphibious ships, we have the opportunity to integrate all three services capabilities to achieve these outcomes. I think there is good precedent for this. The whole of government approach is typified by organisations such as the Australian Civil Military Centre born of our experiences over the last 10 years or so, are indicative of our capacity to routinely coordinate the efforts of several agencies. A new construct for border protection is another example of this. I'd like to expand a little on the idea of integrated naval diplomacy, or perhaps just simply integrated military diplomacy. The program in front of us is of course very Navy and maritime centric. Underpinning much of that discussion are the various environmental based strategies. There is a perception though that those strategies are either or questions, that we somehow have to choose which one is superior. And our message, I think, not just my message, is simply that we don't have to choose one over the other. Or perhaps more accurately, we don't have to choose all of the time. There will be times when one environment naturally leads another. There will be times when we combine the two, two or three. And there will be times when all three must work in tandem. So these next few days will focus on naval and maritime issues, for which I make no apology. Because it, because it is vital to our nation's security and prosperity. And to be really good in our own domain, we need an extensive and sophisticated understanding of what can be achieved. But so too, we need that understanding of the other environments. We must not allow our enthusiasm for naval power or naval diplomacy to blind us into making a false choice. It is important but it is not the only thing which is important and our approach must be sophisticated enough to countenance this. So when I suggest we look at how we integrate all three services into a naval military diplomatic approach, I offer it in this context where we should not be making a choice. Being one-eyed might have worked for a Vice Admirals in 1805 but it's not that good in 2013. I think there are other areas where the character of naval diplomacy may be changing and where we must prepare for the possibility of significant change. For instance, what will the impact of technological developments have on the use of navies for diplomatic tasks? The acceptance of naval forces in a diplomatic role is based on an almost unspoken understanding of their capabilities and the potential they represent. Changes in technology, of course, have the potential to upset that understanding. The current discussion over surveillance activities in exclusive economic zones is one example. But this could go further. For example, if the extension of vital national infrastructure deeper and deeper into nation's maritime zones continues, how will our understanding of concepts such as innocent passage hold up? Will nations seek to place conditions on access to areas around such infrastructure? 
The current restrictions are really very small and mainly focused on the safety of navigation. Is there potential nations will seek to expand them and what implications will this have for naval diplomacy? Another aspect of this whole discussion is the notion of concepts such as smart power and smart defence. And we'll cover that in the next few days as well. Smart defence is, in my view, the force structure pairing to smart power. And while it is often discussed in terms of uh, Europe and NATO, I think it has much broader applicability and that we've already had some excellent examples of it. Just here in Australia, we have at least three examples of smart defence. I would argue that the Anzac class frigate, which was built jointly with the Government of New Zealand uh, to a German Blomenboss design, uh, played to the strengths of both countries and was a very good outcome for both of us. Uh, we could not have achieved the result independently and um, we to this day uh, are still reaping the benefits of that program. A more recent example is the use of Australian sailors to help crew um, New Zealand's HMNZ Endeavour and Wellington. We're working together has created more capability than we could have achieved alone. We've also had Royal New Zealand Navy boarding parties integrated in our frigate in the Middle East. So it's a two-way street. Smart defence does not have to just be amongst near neighbours or traditional partners though. I think it unfair to say uh, that it's only in the last, it's not unfair to say that only in the last 10 years the na navies of Spain and Australia have only really got to know each other and understand each other. As we have done so, we've identified opportunities for smart defence. Most obviously amongst this has been the deployment of the Spanish tanker Cantabria to Australia this year. From my perspective, this has been an outstanding success, not only providing an underway replenishment ship when we required it, but providing us with an opportunity to familiarise ourselves with some of the systems that we are about to acquire in the amphibious ships and the air warfare destroyer. From a Spanish perspective, I think it has allowed them to test the extended deployment capability of the ship in conditions that may, they may not otherwise have been able to do. To effectively have had a foreign sovereign warship operating as part of the RAN for nine months has been a groundbreaking initiative. Many people have asked me how did this work? How could this work? Well, it does. And it's actually been incredibly easy. And the key to this activity was finding common cause, complementary capabilities and needs, and the willingness to cooperate and collaborate. I think of all these activities, smart defence, smart power, integrated naval diplomacy, need what has previously been described as that rare kind of imagination which not only enables us to understand our current circumstances, but to plan for the future as well. I hope you'll take the opportunity that this conference affords, uh, that I hopefully have posed one or two questions to start you off, and perhaps sown the seed for some of that imagination. Thank you.